why don't we why don't we get started Chantel why don't you kick us off oh yeah sure so um on the next slide uh we're well we're going to just talk about like herbal remedies um a little bit about grow my sea uh, we protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy, and give them the opportunity to make a positive impact. So we're, you know, doing some good stuff out here. Um, our work focuses on conservation, education, green spaces, food access, and agriculture. Um, so we hope that you take a look at our distance learning page if you want to learn about any of those things. Um, and in this workshop, it's all about herbalism. So I'm gonna try to keep it really cool and calm because I feel like herbalism is cool and it's calm and it's like, it's refreshing, right? Um, and I'm also gonna talk about the spiritual awareness component that goes into that, how you can make tinctures if you wanted to ever try that, um, cultural appropriation versus appreciation and how that relates to this workshop in general. Um, some drying techniques, and then some recipes that you guys um, will be getting later on that you can kind of try out at home and tell me yes, no, maybe so. Uh, so let's take it off uh, with a disclaimer, basically saying that <laughs> if your doctor told you not to use something, please don't use me as the reason why you're going to use it. Um, you know, just make sure that you are talking to, you know, whoever your health team is, whether that's a doctor or a sage or a farmer or however you're you know taking care of yourself that you're talking to them about the different herbs and the different uses and the dosages that are appropriate for you to use based on your health concerns or whatever's going on with your health because everybody is different so i just want to kind of put that out there um and yeah let's let's keep going uh, so herbalism, which is amazing, is the study of botany, the use of medicinal plants. Um, we've been using herbalism for modern day medicine. Um, opium, aspirin, like Tylenol, like all these different modern conveniences that we have, they all have been birthed from herbalism um, and pulled from different cultures, African culture, Chinese, indigenous, uh, Middle Eastern, Greek, Roman, you name it. Um, we have been pulling all of these different uh, beautiful like herbal remedies um, and kind of compacting them and putting them in science <laughs> that we call it now. Um, and the great thing about all these herbs is that they have all of these different properties. Um, so here we have uh, sleep and relaxation. We have like stomach and nausea, the immune system, different headaches, and the different herbs that can go about treating, curing, or just downright just telling it to stop for a second, um, <laughs> the things you can use to kind of treat those things. And the beautiful thing about a lot of these herbs is that they're interchangeable. They work for different things, the same things. So, you know, gender is great for, you know, the immune system, but also for nausea, right? So you can kind of double up on these herbs if you're having you know, nausea issues, but then you also do have a compromised immune system or you can't sleep that well, but you do get recurring headaches, right? So kind of self-diagnosing yourself and seeing like what elements are popping up for you repeatedly and then seeing what are the different herbs and their benefits and how you can use that for you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about trauma relief because there are actually uh, scientific studies that say that different herbs do help with trauma relief and do provide like a very soothing sensational experience for the body and the mind. And so like, if you might wanna like slow down your thoughts or you know, you might wanna use lavender that helps like treat insomnia and has a very aromatic smell or you might want to, you know, purify a space if you feel like someone has come into your space and they're being really negative and they tainted energy. It's been plenty of times where I've been in a space and it's been beautiful. And then one person comes and it's like the energy is like off completely. And I wish I could just bust out my little sage stick, my little <laughs> smudge stick, and just, you know, kind of like reset the room. Um, 
So you can use like, you know, these different herbs to reset and to deal with some, you know, traumatic events that may have had happened to you if you're dealing with depression or you feel unmotivated or you need energy or you need to be focused, right? So there are um, herbal remedies that you can use to treat those ailments. And a large part of that is also the spiritual connection that I know like a lot of um, stages, they will talk about spirit guides and how you can be more connected to your ancestors. Um, and I do want to say that there are different ways to do that depending on your culture, your connection to the herbs that you're using. Um, and then your just overall belief in the product, which actually makes a real difference. Um, so as we know, the placebo effect is real. And so if you believe that something is working, essentially it will work, right? Um, it might not work like forever, but there will be a period of time where you will feel better, which means that we have the mental capacity to cure ourselves, right? Um, and so some of this is talking about like setting intentions. So like if my intention with this smudge stick is that whenever I use it, I feel rebalanced and um, I feel like, you know, um, the energy is going to be like purified in this space, then that's something that I might set with my smudge stick. Um, and that can look very different. It can look like labeling it. It can look like praying with it. Um, it can look like meditating with it. And a portion of that is something that I call mind mapping. So it's essentially where you are rewiring your brain to pick up on certain sensors that you're intentionally creating. So when I burn this, I'm telling my brain that when I burn this, it's peaceful, right? And so now whenever I smell this, I feel peace. I feel like, oh, the space is about to be peaceful. I'm creating an intentional memory with the smell and the feel of this and um, just this connection to how I'm using it. And so when you're being intentional about how you're using products, you can tap into the spiritual connection with it and also unlock a lot of the mental benefits that go along with it. Um, do I see we have some questions. Do you guys want me to take questions or do it at the end? So we have, um, okay, a couple of things that are popping up. First off, if, you're, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A because that makes it a little easier for us to find. Um, and we have a couple of questions about how holy basil is different than regular basil. Um, oh, this is a different variety. So it, it, people will call it holy basil, holy basil or tulsi. Um, it's just a different variety of basil. And you wouldn't really cook with it. Like it's more for medicinal purposes or teas, right? Versus like the regular sweet kind that we usually use for cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't heard anybody cooking with Tulsi, but if you did, I think, you know, it Let's depends know. on the flavor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, it's different variety. You have to specifically seek it out versus, you know, trying to do any of these things um, with regular basil. Yeah. Okay, that was that's our only one in the Q and A. So I'm okay, just rolling. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so I also wanted to bring up tinctures, which I feel like are really great. They are a concentrated herbal extract, and so in thinking about it, like we always talk about, like the power of the plant, right? And so, like knowing how many minerals and nutrients and all these great things that are that the plant is providing for us and concentrating that into something that you can get like the most benefits from. Um, and so you can make tinctures either using alcohol or using vinegar. And the alcohol or the vinegar, they're just pulling out um, the ingredients from the plant and then they're concentrating them as a liquid for you. So you might want to use alcohol if you know um, you like the flavor of it or the other benefits of using alcohol is that you can either use fresh or dry herbs um, versus when you use vinegar, 
think you can only use dry. Um, so you know you might have that flexibility if you don't if you don't have the herbs dried, um, or maybe you just feel like no, I just want to use some vodka. Need some of that in my life balance, right? That's what life is about. Um, or vinegar if you're you know um, doing this with children. Um, so those are just some things to kind of think about. Um, and then just the benefits of it is this is really easy to consume. It's natural, it's a health booster. Um, it's really inexpensive to make because you're just using like a couple of products, but you do have to have the equipment. So there is like a startup cost if you don't have equipment, right? Um, so you would need like a jar, you would need the vodka, you know, um, in this case, they said, you know, it doesn't have to be super, uh, not a large percentage of alcohol. Um, you would need some parchment paper and yeah, and the herbs and you'd be basically ready to go. So, you know, um, this case, you could use any type of herb that you want. Um, they do say that if you're using dried herbs for alcohol-based tincture, you might want to add more vodka later on because you want to make sure that you're really getting, you know, all the nutrients and stuff out of those herbs. And then you could also substitute vodka for brandy or any other alcohol that's at least 40% proof. So you want to make sure that you have that 40% proof that's there um, and that you're not kind of skimming because that's going to change uh, the dosage. And as far as like dosaging, I will always say like, start slow, start with the smallest dosage that you can, just to see how your body is responding to the tincture. Um, because it's powerful plant medicine. And so you don't want to start off with a whole vial of the thing, and then you have a negative reaction to it, right? Um, or sometimes you have too much of a good reaction to it, and it starts to overload your system because your body's like, hey, where did all this goodness come from, right? So you got to kind of work it in there slowly and um, get your body used to, you know, using the tincture. Uh, the next slide is just how you can do it using vinegar. This is for folks who might want to avoid alcohol, uh, maybe because you're doing it with children. Maybe you have personal reasons why you don't want to use alcohol. Um, so you can use vinegar. And for vinegar, like I said, you would only use um, dry herbs. And um, nobody really talks about like the taste of the vinegar tinctures. I don't think that there's like a big difference, but there might be like a slight bitterness. And then also like the vinegar tinctures, they have a shorter shelf life. So I would say make a smaller quantity versus like if you were using alcohol. So that way you're not like wasting it and you don't feel pressure to use more of it because you don't want to waste it. And then you end up not taking the advice to start slow, right? So <laughs> make, make smaller dosages so that way you can, um, start slower and not feel like you're wasting product that you're trying to make. Um, and yeah, now we're gonna get into cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation, which is gonna make a ton of sense when we get to the next slide. Um, and so, <laughs> right, um, so cultural appreciation, um, just take me back one second, Laura. Um, Culture appreciation is when you are seeking to understand. And I think I wanted to start there because I think a lot of folks do want to understand and do want to be connected to each other. And, you know, they want to find out about other people's cultures and explore things in the same way. They want to be, everybody want to be down, right? And so um, the beautiful thing <laughs> right, about wanting to be down is that you have like all these different perspectives and you have all these people who are speaking life into you and are sharing you know things with you but when you are appropriating you don't really have that knowledge there you don't really have the leaders um, that are telling you hey this is appropriate this is not appropriate and then there's those gray areas because context is necessary for a lot of things, especially when we're talking about culture, heritage, um, and just overall how people are going to respond. And so um, 
there are some great questions that you can ask yourself, like, you know, um, who am I sourcing this from? You know, are they a part of the culture that I respect? You know, am I willing to listen to BIPOC and indigenous leaders? Um, did I research this? Do I know about the ecological and culture significance of this, right? Before I start putting stuff on me or saying certain things or using certain products, it's like, do I really know a lot about this? And do I recognize the context that's, that's within this? Do I understand why folks were using this or were saying this? And how am I bringing my culture into the conversation? How does this connect to me? So I think, you know, um, we should all take steps to think about how we can be more conscious of how we're using products or how we are showing up in spaces. So that way we can be appreciating other people's culture and not appropriating it. And that leads us to my next slide, which is skip the sage, smudge dicks. Um, <laughs> and so, for smudge sticks um, are amazing. Like I said, you know, that energy, the bad juju, I'm, I'm taking it away, right? Um, but it has become very commercialized. And because of commercialization, a lot of uh, farmers haven't had the same access to sage as other folks and a lot of indigenous folks who use sage um, for practices, uh, for their cultural practices have not had the same access to it. And so um, as this is coming up in conversations with me and other farmers, I did want to, I felt implored to share this information with you. So that way you can start seeking out other alternatives if you want to keep smudging and keep practicing herbalism. Um, so lavender is really great. Like we said, we talked we talk about helping insomnia. It's a beautiful smell. It loves to be harvested. Uh, mugwort, which is primarily seen as a weed, um, can also be used as a smudge stick. And honestly, someone burnt, someone was burning uh, mugwort and it had like a very like hallucinogen, like very relaxing smell. It's similar to like LSD, like it's like you like it's like a trip, but it's not like a bad trip. It's like a beautiful, like airy spring trip, and you're like conscious and aware, and it's like burning. And it's beautiful. It's an experience. So if you want to burn something and you feel like <laughs> you want to take this experience, I'm telling you about. You could try mugwort. Um, there's also rosemary, um, cedar. It's not, it's not actually a drug. No, it's, it's, it's not a drug. <laughs> It's a normal herb, <laughs> it's a normal plant. <laughs> Just clarification. Okay, yes, no, it's not a drug. It's a normal plant, but it has like, you know, these great like hallucinogen like benefits and properties that, you know, some other plants also have. So like, don't be discouraged by that. Don't think that you're like gonna get high or something like it's not like that. It's more like, just like, like opening up your senses. Like I'm trying to do this hand movement so you could like understand that it's like, it's just like opening you up like all the way. It's, it's beautiful, honestly. Um, there's myrrh, rose. Uh, I didn't even know that you could turn rose into a smudge stick, but apparently you can. And the rose petals, um, they smell beautiful. Uh, the cedar smells really great, thyme and Tulsi. So, you know, these are some herbs that you can use to kind of alternative, alternate between that and sage um, and just being more conscious about your usage of sage or your uses of doing certain commercial things that are trendy, right? Um, um, Chantel, you're getting a lot of love in the chat for all these um, alternatives. And then just for some clarification, so the smudge sticks is all dried herbs that you just bundle together and then yeah. you can carefully light them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes. Um, and so in the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about these different drying techniques, um, which are really great for folks who have access to a growing space. And Chantel, we're getting questions about, do you have to dry these or can you just burn them? Like, how do you do this? Um, I would suggest drying them because burning fresh herbs, it's just gonna burn. It's gonna smell like you burnt it. It's not gonna have yeah. like, 
It's not going to have like smoke. Yeah. Impact, right. So exactly. You can all of these different things and like bundle them together into a stick. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then there are also like a lot of great um, farmers who make smudge sticks like on site or you could purchase them or you could learn how to make them. They're actually not really that hard to make, to be honest, um, especially like if you're using like alternative stuff, you're basically like just stacking all of the dry herbs together and then you're just taking like some cotton twine and like turn it around and then it's like, yay, burn. Yeah, it's like that's <laughs> like that's kind of like <laughs> how it is. Um, but you can use like these different drying techniques, which are really easy. Um, I would say the classic that I don't have here is just putting herbs in a paper bag. Um, and if you just put it in a paper bag and just leave it alone, it'll dry. And you don't have to do anything else. You can just leave it alone. Um, the other techniques are bunching and hanging. This you would need like a cool dark spot maybe like a closet or like a cupboard or something like that where you could have them bunched and hanging upside down uh you can also microwave them which is awesome because i didn't even um know before we started doing these herbal workshops that you could um dry herbs by microwaving them the microwaving <laughs> we learned you just have to be careful not with the paper towel. So you just have to do it in very short intervals, um, mm -hmm. just a few seconds at a time and at the lowest setting. Yes, thank you, Laura. Safety first when microwaving. Um, I think it's 30 second, 30 second intervals and maybe do maybe 15 seconds if you can't turn it down. Cause I'm, cause I don't know how to turn the, the, the level down on my microwave. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you can also use a dehydrator um, or you can dry them in the oven. So here are a couple of, like different techniques that you can use and um, all leading up to, you know, making uh, some products, right? So making herbal tea, which is amazing. And but herbal tea, you they don't necessarily have to be dried. It could be fresh herbs as well. They have like the steepers, which I think are really cool. Um, and then you could kind of like mix and match it. Um, you can make it hot, you can make it iced, and you can just add in all of these different benefits. You know, you could be like, my tea is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, anti-allergenic, anti anti, you know what I'm saying? It could just be anti everything, but it's just so good for you, right? Um, and you can have like these beautiful like uh, blends. Um, another recipe that we have here is uh, something from our very, from one of our coworkers, uh, Dorothy. She gave us this arthritis and joint pain remedy where you use avocado pits and vodka and a kitchen towel and a hammer. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm young, but you know, I be having some joint pain, so I might try to say, <laughs> you know, uh, cause I, I I never know what to do with the avocado pits. Um, you know, they usually we try to grow another avocado, which is cool. I know Laura did that, um, but other than that, there I really haven't seen anything. No, that how you many avocado trees can I have in my apartment? <laughs> right, exactly. So I think this one was really awesome. Um, so I'm really excited about trying out uh, this recipe. Um, another recipe that we have is making dandelion candy, which I thought was really great because a lot of farmers don't actually like dandelion um, on the sites. So they'd be really happy for you to come and harvest all their dandelion for them, um, as long as you don't blow it. Um, and this one is really great because it's good for like coughs. Um, it's a, like, it requires like the making, the, the knowledge of like making candy. So if you're someone who likes to make car candy or you like to bake, um, or you just want to try out like, like more like natural lozenges, this could be a great alternative for you. I know other folks, they do just like honey candies, like honey and herb candies. So you could kind of like play around with it and like just have like a lot of fun, like finding out like different herbal remedies and trying them out um, and seeing like how they fit into like 
your overall lifestyle. And questions, because we got time today. You get it? <laughs> Still gets me every time. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, have, we do have some questions. Someone is asking, what is the risk of, dry, of growing our own herbs? And why is it unsafe to dry our own herbs for tea? It's, um, it's not unsafe to dry herbs for tea. You can dry them. You can have them fresh. Um, I don't think there's really any risk in growing your own herbs. I think this was in relation to the, our first slide. We had the disclaimer. Oh, okay. Because we were saying, you know, you never know how potent your tincture is going to be sometimes, or you're not sure if you're going to have an allergic reaction to something. Right. Or if you're buying the supplement from a company that has not been testing them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, what Laura was saying, just about like dosages, um, just being mindful of that, especially like if you're on other medication, um, because it might interfere with your medication. Um, or if you're on a strict diet, or if you have like any like serious health related um, issues, I would say, you know, just as a prerequisite to always, you know, let your medical team, and your support team know that you're going to be trying different stuff, and you're going to be ingesting different things, um, just in case. Yeah, there are like some better known ones, like, I know for me, you can't do anything with St. John's work that interacts with another medicine that I take. So just check if you're that kind of stuff. Right, exactly. I also yeah. think a little feedback just so you guys know. So maybe we should mute if we're not talking. Just FYI. I also once was experimenting with some herbal supplements and then went out and about as I normally would. So I didn't spend like an unusual amount of time outside, but I got easily the worst sunburn of my life and then when I was looking up the supplements like that was one of the things that could potentially happen was like it increased sun sensitivity so that's why it's very good to take things in small amounts and talk to your your healthcare team just to make sure there's not something you um didn't anticipate going in um this is the next question uh is what if they're if they don't have dry herbs can they use fresh ones um, yeah, for some stuff, like I said, with the tinctures, um, if you were doing like an alcohol-based tincture, or you can use fresh or dry herbs. Um, but if you're doing vinegar, you want to keep it dry because the fresh is just going to get like molded. Um, like the vinegar is not high enough concentrate in order to keep the herbs from being molded. Um, for teas, fresh or dry, it just depends on, on what, you know, you're going to be trying to make or what you're going to be trying to do. Um, and there is a lot of information. There are a lot of sages um, and a lot of elders who have been practicing herbalism for a, lot, for a long time. And um, you can look them up and, you know, get extra advice. One thing I just, sorry, one thing to just to jump in is um, if you're using dried herbs, it's going to be more concentrated. So for example, if I'm making herbal tea, if I'm using like fresh lemongrass, then I have to add more. But if I have dried, I would use half the amount. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, where do you, do, can we recommend any resources like books or websites for tinctures and herbal healing recipes? If we, if we don't have one now, I think that's one we can look up and add later to the resources that we're going to send out. But um, just, I'll let you both share if you have a good one. Um, I can't think of any on top of my head, but I know that Laura and I did compile like resources um, for this workshop. So there are going to be a plethora of resources that you can click through. Probably too much. You can be like, she did too much. Um, <laughs> uh, so there will be a lot of things for you guys to be able to look up and, um, and just fact check and do your own research and yeah, that's just, we had a lot of questions about this. We are going to send a recording and follow up resources to everyone. So if there were recipes in here today and you're trying to scribble them down really fast, you're going to get them. And you're also going to get some additional 
recipes and um, DIY remedies that uh, we sourced from, we asked the Grow NYC community who are, you know, very earthy people, what DIY recipes they use and they we put together that as well. So that's gonna come to your inbox in the next couple of days. Um, thank you, somebody's pointing out that you do need to be careful with dandelion because there is a toxic plant that looks quite similar. So that's a very good reminder to never harvest anything unless you really know what it is and can vouch with 100% certainty. So thank you for pointing that out. That's true. There also is like, there also are apps that you can use, um, like iNaturalista, um, a Google Lens, where you could take a picture of a plant and it tells you what plant it is. So I would say if you're foraging um, and you kind of like, eh, it looks similar, like double check, triple check, because a lot of things that look similar to things are not in all actuality, what it is that you're looking for. So, yeah. How long do vinegar tinctures last? Um, I don't know if I had got a definitive time frame, but I think within like a couple weeks or so versus like the alcohol, which you could keep for maybe like a month or so. The longer <laughs> potent it's going to be, so it is good to use it like sooner rather than later. Right, which is why I'm like, it's better to just like make smaller portion sizes because that way then you don't have to really worry about spoilage. Um, and then you have more control over like, you know, sometimes we have mixed stuff and other people use it and we don't know because we made so much of it. And then it's like, you know, you just want to be aware of, you know, if folks are using it, how they're using it, how much they're taking, um, just being very like intentional about that. Sorry, I got distracted by all of your really interesting comments in the chat. Um, okay, so when you're growing herbs, how important is it to use non-GMO seeds and or organic soil? I'll say, there, I think there's a lot of different opinions on this, but I also think if you're trying to grow for something especially medicinal, that the purer the version of it, the better. So um, I think we would always advocate for non-GMO seeds and organic soil. And we know that's not always like in the cards for everyone, but um, when, uh, when you can, I would say that's probably the better route to go. Um, yeah. And I think when you can't and you like the seeds are really expensive, you know, you can go to like your local like farm or like a garden store and just ask them like, hey, is this organic? And just take a cut in. Like, that's what I would do. Um, and just water propagate it. And now you got you a new plant and you just plant that when you get home. <laughs> like, or you can ask your friend. Like, um, when you're done making recipes, I think that I think she's referring to tinctures. Like, how long do you wait before you can open it up and like smell it and test your bottle? Oh, that I think will be in the resources because the person that I got that recipe from, she's been making tinctures like forever, and she has like so many like great tips and tricks like for how to make it. So I don't want to like say something and then that's not, you know, what is provided in the resources. So I'll get back to you. Okay, so I think we answered everything we had in the q and A. I'm doing a quick scroll through. Yeah, okay. So, so can I ask a, a quick clarification question also for the tinctures? Do you just put that directly like a little drop in your mouth or do you mix it with water? How do you do, how do you use them? Yeah, so you just take it directly. So you have the droplet and usually it's like, people will recommend like one third of what the dropper is that you take as a first dosage. Um, yeah, and then you would just take it. Thanks. Yeah. And people are throwing some good like info in the chat, like 
I was thinking the same thing. Someone was like, proceed with caution when cooking sugar, because yes, it is really, really hot and you do need to be extremely careful. It's very easy to splutter. Um, and then somebody else is cautioning on the apps and like 100% agree, they're not always accurate. So it's good to like cross-reference with different apps, but really when in doubt, you know, multiple sources of confirmation are really, really good. If, when in doubt, farmers markets like have a lot of these materials and then you know that they are absolutely that thing. So um, yes, definitely be cautious anytime you're sourcing something you didn't directly plant yourself or purchasing from a, you know, like purchase from a store. Um, and we're gonna yeah. Thank you for all these thanks in here as well. We're really glad that you've enjoyed these workshops and, and that many of you have been, we've seen you, like maybe not in person, but we've seen your names many times. So thank you for like sticking with us as well. Yeah, awesome. And also I was gonna say like for clarification, like like feel free to like go to like community gardeners or like other like farm sites that you might have access to and just ask them like hey what's this or i want to do this what do you think about that and like get their opinion because they might have a better way of doing it they might have a better recipe um they're growing the stuff on the land and so they might have better access to it you might not even need to buy seeds right um so just kind of just offering that up to like go to your farmer, your local farmer, your local gardener and um, get some additional information if you need it. Yay, Jen, try that mugwort. <laughs> you know what's really exciting about the mugwort is I feel like you get so much hate in the garden world, but it does have this whole like medicinal background to it. So I feel like anything we can like do to get people excited about mugwort instead of like, oh no, it's in my garden is great. So exactly. Yeah. And there was even a woman who made mugwort muffins and they were actually really good. Um, so, you know, you can cook with it. Um, I'm always gonna big up mugwort. That's the ancestral plant. So if you see it and you feel like you could use it for another thing, that's great. Were they savory or sweet? I have to, you know. They were a little sweet, but it was like, it was like a, it was like I don't know the way she did the dough, but it was like, like a like see, like it was like soft and like sweet, but it was like a little savory. It, it had like an interesting, like balance, you know. It made me hungry, which is just good. I was already hungry, so it like, <laughs> cake sounded pretty good. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you have questions after you've got our stuff here, uh, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, we have another workshop oh, okay. next yes, Wednesday. So same time next Wednesday. Um, I can put the link in the chat before you go, but we'll also be sending this all to you in the follow up email. What's the workshop, Laura? Summer planting for fall harvest. So if you are um, a gardener and you're wondering what you can plant in August and July and September and even October, we're gonna go over all that kind of stuff. Here, I have the link, so I'll put it in the chat right now. Um, you can all sign up and we'll be back here next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Awesome. Oh, and someone asked like, oh, is it easy to grow mugwort? And it's so easy. I would say don't even plant it because you can, it'll come to your, if you have a garden, it'll be there. The governor's island where we have a teaching garden is just filled with mugwort. And I'm sure like places like that, they don't spray any pesticides. There's no animal contamination. They actually bring goats onto the island to help cut back the mugwort because it's taking over all the other plants. So you know what that means, guys? Free mugwort. Get your prunes out. <laughs> party out there <laughs> thank you all appreciate you yeah thank you everybody um so hopefully we'll see you next week at wednesday and be on the lookout for your email with all of the follow-up resources and all of these recipes that came from your friends at grow nyc and let us know if you try them and i the word on the street is that there's going to be an instagram post asking people to submit their like favorite natural remedies as well. So that's going to be another source from all over like our, our Instagram followers. And if you have some you want to throw them there too, go for it. Um, so thank you again. Hopefully we'll see you next week. And we'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye everyone.